there's only one person that that will be the toughest critic uh, for you, and it's the guy that's looking across at you at the in the mirror. This is Dave Meltzer with Entrepreneurs the Playbook. I have actually one of my other heroes. He doesn't know it, Donovan McNabb. Unbelievable quarterback, pro bowler, Syracuse superstar. But the list will go on, but we're not here to talk about your football accolades. I I'm, thought you were going to keep going. Oh, I, I will. I can read I them off. I was about to say, all right. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. You know, one of the things I love about Donovan is, you know, Warren Moon is my business partner. Mm -hmm. And when we first met, you leaned over and you said, Warren's my hero. I'm like, me too. <laughs> <laughs> what was it that you looked up to in Warren Moon? Well, you know, Warren's a fighter. And I think for all athletes or, or just normal human beings, when you find a person that uh, you can kind of relate to, when things don't go your way, you, you're getting voices on the outside, uh, people are saying what you can't do instead of kind of promoting the things that you can do. Uh, and, and from Warren's story uh, and for where he ended up and, and the things that he was able to do, uh, being African-American, uh, a guy who can play the position, who was smarter than they gave him credit for, uh, very successful everywhere he ended up, um, and he's a winner. And that was something that I see myself in. And he was kind of the bar for me. And for a guy that, that I truly looked up to, he reached out a hand to me and, and just – Gave me advice when I needed it. I always would call and check on me. Um, you know, we kind of threw some things off of each other. And for him to be rewarded uh, to be in the Hall of Fame was well-deserved. Uh, and that gave light to every other player uh, of the African-American descent to play the position that you have a chance. And, and for Warren and the CC, how successful he is off of the field now, it's something that we all continue to follow. You know, it's great because I see Warren and my – one of our goals was that as your career went, you were known as a black quarterback. Right. Right. They actually, it was part of the title. Yeah. And we would say, gosh, you know, our goal someday is these quarterbacks Absolutely. will just be known as tall, strong, stupid, you know, exactly. Whatever, you know, exactly. Drug addict, whatever yeah. the guy is. Mm -hmm. But why does color have to matter? And you were really, you know, you had Marlon Briscoe, then Warren Moon, mm -hmm. right? Doug. Yes. But you, you there, were someone that so many kids also, you held a great responsibility because if kids can't see it, right, most of them can't believe it. What made Warren extraordinary and you extraordinary, there wasn't much to look at mm -hmm. to say, oh, I can do that. Mm -hmm. You know, you had very few people to look up to. Now, everybody can do it. Right. It's like the four minute mile. Once it's broken, <laughs> you know, everybody starts running a four minute mile. What type of pressure did that put on you? Because there's enough pressure to play in the league, mm -hmm. to be a quarterback in the league to be a pro bowler in the league, to go to championships in the league. True. But, you know, everybody's looking at you through a microscope when you played. People today don't get what it was like, but if you did something, it was amplified. Well, you know what's funny? Uh, you know, my path and my journey was a little bit different than Randall and Warren and, and Doug I forgot Randall, and Russell. Right. <laughs> and, and those guys, I would say, lit the torch for us. And they lit the torch and they, they passed the torch on. And I felt like I reached my hand out and I grabbed it because – I felt like there was there were so many opportunities for us to showcase our talents if we were given that chance. And I thought the way that you kind of receive that chance and open the door for others is by proving people wrong. And the way that Warren went on to prove by playing in the Canadian League, uh, playing in the NFL, and still playing at an elite level, I felt like he was still overlooked. And not only was he overlooked, but it was – it was kind of a look past because of his skin color, and and I felt if we keep, if we continue this opportunity by playing on the high school level, playing on the being able to play on a collegiate level, uh, you can't really look past us. And I felt like at that particular time, um, myself, Akili Smith, um, Dante Cole Pepper, uh, Sean King, that year in '99, where you have so many Af African American quarterbacks who had played at an elite level and have a chance now to be first-round draft picks, really opened up the door for guys behind us. Uh, and that's when you see on the high school level play, people wearing number five or, or, or have an opportunity to get a Division I scholarship to an elite school, a BCS school. Um, and then not only that, but play on the center stage, play on the national stage 
uh, four national championship, the Deshaun Watsons, uh, yeah. the Jalen Hurts. Uh, I throw Tua in there. Um, you and know, and Cam the list Newton. goes on. <laughs> I mean, the list goes on where you look on a collegiate level, every Division One school has an Afri- African-American quarterback. It, or if not, they're recruiting them heavily. Uh, so it opens up the door, and now you look back at the Pop Warner level. You know, you go out as, about, as far as the Pop Warner level, where you're seeing these these kids who have the ability to play the quarterback position, and it's just a bonus that they can move, that they have mobility. And it's not about, hey, you know what, he's a black quarterback. You know what, he's a pretty good quarterback. Right. Uh, and Watch one Cam that's going to be great. Watch Cam Newton throw a football. Well, if he it, couldn't run, it'd probably be better for him. But that's the thing. <laughs> it, but that's the thing. It's just – it's we focus on the extra, the bonus. Right. You know, for Cam Newton, he won MVP. No one wants to talk about that. Yeah. He was the youngest quarterback to reach uh, 30,000 passing or 10,000 passing yards um, and to play in a Super Bowl. Right. Where now you look at the list of quarterbacks that have played in the Super Bowl, you know, Doug has played in the Super Bowl. I've played in the Super Bowl. Cam Newton has played in the Super Bowl. You know, there's, there's a pretty, pretty o- great opportunity for others to be able to achieve that goal. Yeah, it was kind of fun to watch you play in the Super Bowl because when I remember when you were drafted, I know Philly uh, boos everything, but you were actually booed when you were drafted. Yeah, and yeah. but I don't think that was a, a color thing. I think it was just people didn't. They believe. had an idea who they wanted. Yeah, right. They had an idea who they wanted. And, and again, I don't get upset of someone's opinion, you know, but just kind of have some information or evidence with it. Um, you know, because there are comments that I make that people make it a little rattled. Uh, but there's evidence of, of what I say. Um, and and, and I, I love the fact that uh, they felt that way because that was more motivation for me. You know, and, and you're an extraordinary person off the field. Right. So you have the, uh, you know, the Donovan McNabb fun with mm-hmm. diabetes. But also, you know, people look at athletes and just think, oh, they can be an announcer. They, they can be a broadcaster. I know that's not true. Akbar is <laughs> right. one of my good friends, and he had a, two years on the sideline for free with the Chargers because, you know, as his agent, who's my friend, said, he, he just doesn't get it, Dave. He was horrible, and he worked at it. Yeah. But you are extraordinary. You know, guys, I, I even like, uh, what's his name from Dallas that came on now, the ex-quarterback. He's, T- Tony Romo. Yeah, Romo's great, right? You're like Romo. Your insight, you can't replace that when mm-hmm. you're on TV. Someone that is actually sat in the pocket, and you see things so much different. Differently. Um, but there's a bunch of naysayers out there always. Of course. Right? Of course. How do you teach people, and I think you know, this is a great entrepreneurial question, to separate themselves not only from the bad opinion, but I also see athletes get caught into the good opinions, right? They start believing. They start believing in everything yeah, they hear. How do you separate yourself from all those opinions? There's only one person that, that will be the toughest critic uh, for you, and it's the guy that's looking across at you at the, in the mirror. Um, you have to understand who you are as a person. Uh, if you're stepping into a situation where you're unprepared, um, you have no clue of what to do. Uh, and for the broadcasting aspect, if you're not very good in front of the camera because you're shy, you know, it's going to be tough for you. And you know, people pat you on the back, people who you love. They always say, oh, you were great. <laughs> you're right. you know, I didn't really understand what you, saying what you were saying, but you were great. You look good. Right. Uh, and when people say something like that, you know, you're kind of like, oh, did I? <laughs> Is that good or bad? <laughs> but you have to be true to yourself. That's first and foremost. And then secondly, do you really love doing it? You know, it has to be a passion for you. When you step in front of the camera for a question that's presented to you, do you have a true answer? And can I look you in the eye and give that answer where people will, will know at the end of the conversation, wow, that was deep. Right. That was something that was that was genuine. Or is it something that's rehearsed? Um, and, and that's something that I took pride in, and I've always wanted to become a broadcaster or analyst when I was younger. My goal around eight or nine was to be a sports broadcaster, <laughs> and that's why I went to Syracuse University because they were in the top three as far as sports broadca- broadcasting was concerned. And so, you know, people look at the football aspect of it. I plan for life after football uh, at a young age. Yeah, and football was just an opportunity. For me to get on center stage and showcase my talents from an athletic standpoint. But you always have to have a game plan when things happen or you decide to walk away. Uh, And broadcasting was my was my next step. And were was football the only as a broadcaster, was football the only thing that you looked at or would you not at all? I broadcast everything. And I 
basketball was my genuine sport, my number one sport. You and one. Uh, you yeah. know, it, it, it was. And I saw myself going to the NBA. And as a young kid, I think we all do. Yeah. Um, but I also play baseball. I thought I'd be the commissioner. Oh, see? I'm short, uh, Jewish. Nothing wrong with that. Went to law school. <laughs> David Stern to Dave Silver to Dave Meltzer. Hey, you make more of the money. Exactly. You know? <laughs> but I, I love all sports. And I love to talk all sports. You know, when I hear of the of the term barbershop talk, that's me every day. That's great. You know, and I have nieces and nephews who play hockey. So I've learned hockey. Wow. Um, all my kids have learned so- soccer. They play soccer at a young age. Now, some things that, you know, I got to check out more about soccer, but you still learn. Basketball, football, you know, the list goes on of, of just sports that I love to talk about. And for everyone that listens, uh, if we're on radio or if we're on TV, you can definitely tell the excitement of it when I talk about sports. Right, and like Robin Roberts and Michael Strahan, they've love proven, them. right, they're great broadcasters. It doesn't even matter if it's sports, mm-hmm. right? You're just good at conversation. You have great yes. life insight. You, you have so many different facets in order to get to where you were. Right. You know, a lot of people think you have to love, you know, do what you love. No. I, I disagree, right? Well, give no. me your opinion of that. I, I think it's important for you to step out of the box and be able to explain something that people may not have seen you in. Um, so for me to talk hockey, you know, people laugh about it at first and then they're like, wow, you are really insightful. And it's like, yeah, you know, first of all, you got to study. Uh, secondly, you have to be able to present it in a way that people will understand it at the end of the conversation. And at the end of the day, I mean, is it a productive conversation? You know, I can sit here and talk about, oh, you know, what Crosby with a great goal, you know, from the left wing. It's like, oh yeah. yeah, wow. He's seen that, (laughs) you know, but they didn't know about the assist, the setup. They didn't know about the great defense down at the other end. Uh, they didn't know about the stop, the key stop to, to help them win 3-2. Um, and that's things like that, that that really start to shake up a lot of people. Or for basketball, for a sense. You know, people talk about the great art now of people shooting from the logo. Well, there are two, two key players who can do that at a 40% or better clip, and that's Dame Lillard or, or Steph Curry. You know, and it's not about the three. It's about can you shoot the two consistently? You know, talk about Kevin Durant getting free throws. Spots. Or 81-3 yeah. free throws. Well, what that's that what I'm right? saying, yeah. you know. <laughs> or if Steph Curry shooting 60% from the field uh, inside the three-point lane. No one talks about that, you know. So I, I just think for everyone that may kind of be around me or I talk to it or interviews or whatever, that's something I like to go in depth with because now I'm really giving you the insight instead of you just coming in with the mindset like I'm going to just kind of be plain Jane or Captain Obvious. One of the other things that you do really well, you know, as I've watched you, is the emotional aspect of the announcing side where, you know, no matter what sport you play, right. you see things on the bench, right? You see the coach, how, you, and you can talk about being one point down with so many seconds. Like right. these, it's called situational knowledge that you have so much of. I love how you draw. You could be talking about hockey and it could be really close and you could give an analogy of a game at Syracuse right. or a game, you know, with the Eagles or, or Minnesota, wherever you were. And it's really interesting, right? Instead of just reporting what you see. Well, you know, I think it's important that you kind of take it back to your experience. When you're watching something and you're in a tough situation, you know what, back back in high school, my coach would always tell me, continue to stay positive because the other people around you will kind of feed off of your energy. And that's when you reflect back to the actual game and say, you know what, this offensive tackle's fired up in the huddle. He's really picking up and exuding the energy in that huddle where now this may be a big play on third and short. And all of a sudden they get a, a long run from the running back and the first person that's out there getting excited is that tackle that you talked about. Or, or whatever it may be in different scenarios. I think it's important that you reflect back on it and then be able to get back to the, the task at hand. Too many times announcers want to reflect a little bit too much on their past and they continue to reflect back on their past. Right, right. Where you're just like, okay, um, <laughs> I don't think I was born at that time. Short story long, yeah. right? <laughs> but, I mean, it's just the excitement of it all. It's just you have to be able to provide energy for your listeners, for your viewers, to get a better understanding of what it is that you're looking at and then break it down in that way. And you've practiced so much. I mean, you're so articulate. Thank and you. people think that it's, you know, a, a born trait. Mm-hmm. I, it's a developed state. I mean, I had to work myself, even though all the schooling, everything I've done, it's, mm-hmm. it, you know, go back and listen to the first podcast that I did. I'm sitting there going, did I actually, you know, keep saying that exact same thing in the right. same way? Um, for you, what was the most difficult thing in transitioning from playing into the booth? I, w- I would say more of, understanding your listeners. Um, it's a little different than talking in the, in the locker room, 
talking, sitting around in the cafeteria, being in a meeting room, uh, then reaching out to the masses. Um, you know, we can talk about anything when, when we're with our guys. You know, conversation right. to kind of go everywhere. <laughs> and then everyone would kind of catch on. It's like one of those ones where you're like, what? Oh, okay. <laughs> but when you're talking on camera, you have to be able to get right to your point. Get to your point, be able to explain your, your point, given that good background, that evidence, and then get out. You know, because on TV, you only have about 30 seconds. Uh, a segment may be two and a half minutes. Yeah. You know, maybe three minutes. And you have to be able to get your point across from the very beginning when the question is asked and then also give out your supporting statements. And so now you pass it to someone else. Yeah, the two things I found most difficult was waiting. Like you didn't realize how much went on around the actual camera side mm -hmm. and then eating. All, that food, that it food snacks everywhere. everywhere. It snacks everywhere. Yeah, you Those find yourself dipping your hand back into the M and M's. Exactly, because you're peanuts. bored. Exactly. Yeah. All right. La last question. You do so much for charity. Yes. Right. We've talked about older players that have given back to you, other people that have given back to you. Right. The Donovan McNag Fund addresses a huge issue in America. Yes. Diabetes is a huge issue. Yes. Um, what motivates you most with the fund about giving back and leaving your legacy? What do you want that to look like? Well, you know what? I started the foundation back in the early 2000s, and, and it was one that was very close to my heart. My, fi my father was diagnosed with diabetes. My brother has diabetes. Uh, my grandfather had diabetes. Um, so it was one in which I was enriched in my family. And for me, it was one in which I felt it was important to be able to spread the awareness of the particular disease. In the African-American community, um, you know, we are, we're ingrained in salt and everything that we do. Uh, it's about flavor. Uh, and sometimes that catches up to you, not only just in the African-American community, but just across the world. Uh, a lot of people are, have been diagnosed with the diabetes, but it may have been too late. You know, so I try to spread the awareness for everyone to go out and get tested and learn more about not only yourself, but your family history. Uh, and then be able to touch one person's life to maybe explain to them your process and what things that you went through in order to find out more information about it. So now they will do the same and it will continue on to be a domino effect. So uh, I've supported diabetes camps out in Pennsylvania. Uh, I've been a part of the Diabetes Association for years. And um, it's one in which I think is very important not just for diabetes, but for everything. Find out everything about your health. Um, because I, I have a lot of friends that have, have kind of went through the whole cancer deal. Yeah, um, I've, I've had, obviously, diabetes being a part of my life and also in, in family and friends. Uh, and the list goes on of just learning more about your health because I think it's very important in me being on a platform where I can be able to express that and reach out to the masses and, and just kind of make sure that they're aware of, of uh, their future. Uh, and then also for them to understand if they have been diagnosed with diabetes, your life's not over. You just have to rearrange a few things, uh, monitor your eating. Stop going you know, to New Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, make sure you hit the gym and yeah. uh, just kind of focus in on your, your body because I think it's very important. How old, you know, like I turned 50, so there's obviously mm -hmm. some new awareness things you have to do when you turn 50 for right. detection. But for diabetes, how old should you be to go get tested at least for diabetes? I personally think, you know, you that it starts at a teenage age because you never know. It could start young for some people. It may start late. But I think when you go out and get blood work and do all that other stuff for, for maybe a sports physical for these some of these teenagers or some that are in college, you know, to go out and just kind of find out a little bit more about your health and, and see where you are. Um, because I think it's important if you catch it early, then you can monitor it the right way. But as you kind of get in the 30s and 40s and 50s, and all of a sudden, you know, I'm just go see my doctor. And then now you get some sudden news. It's kind of like, oh, you feel like your world has been rocked. But there's still opportunity for you to get right back on track. And so I think if we start at an early age and make that kind of an annual deal, maybe every five to ten years, then I think, you know, you'll have a grasp on things. My favorite thing about meeting and being friends with quarterbacks is they're presidential, right? You to be a quarterback, you have to be a leader, mm -hmm. and the higher the levels go, I I love you know working with the Pro Football Hall of Fame because it's so much fun for me to see, you know, the kid who's the high school all state quarterback right. thinking he's God, mm -hmm. and then you go to college. And then you have the All-American in college, and you were a finalist for the Heisman Trophy. That's a whole nother level. Then yeah. you make the league. Then you're a starter. Then you're a pro bowler. 
then you're a Hall of Famer. Then even within the Hall of Famer, you know, there's still, you know, sort of doubts. Joe, Joe, you know, Warren Moon, Troy Aikman, those guys. There's levels, but you're all presidential. So I'm going to ask I, I, an extra question because I said it was the last, but I always like to ask the leaders of the leaders, right? The Pro Bowlers of the Pro Bowlers, future Hall of Famer. I, you got my vote. Thanks. Um, <laughs> What best piece of advice would you give people? All the things you've learned and seen, what, what's like that number one thing that you see a little kid and you give them that one piece of advice? It's never as bad as it seems and it's never as good as you think. Nice. For, for kids and adults, teenagers as well, uh, when you're having a down day or maybe even a down week, if you continue to stay positive and just kind of Kind of just take yourself off of that path that you were you were just on, and refocus on another. You'll eventually get back on the path that you set for yourself if you just believe in yourself. If you believe in yourself, anything can be achieved. There you go, the modern day Napoleon Hill, Donovan McNabb, <laughs> with Dave Meltzer here, the Nostradamus. There you go, entrepreneurs, the playbook. <laughs> if you've enjoyed this episode, of the playbook, learn more valuable lessons right over here.